Good morning and welcome to the Mountain Within Leadership Summit. I'm Dr. Hertha von Stiegel and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all, those of you who sit here in the auditorium as well as the many viewers who are joining us through the marvels of technology. This is the Nairobi Central Seventh-day Adventist Church Camp Meeting and we have been surrounded by all the bad news about COVID-19, this disease that we have no cure for. And many of us have been praying about this being over. We want it behind us. We want this thing to pass. But this morning, I want to invite each one of us to actually think about what is God trying to teach us during this time of crisis? We often say a crisis is a terrible thing to waste, and that applies to this pandemic. I have thought long and hard about this, and I think there are at least three things that this crisis demonstrates so clearly. Number one, everything rises and falls on leadership. What we are seeing is countries that are well run by leaders who really care, they are faring much better than those who are not. Companies the same way, churches the same way, leadership that cares, that is science-based, that makes a difference. Secondly, I think we are learning this wonderful meaning of the Kiswahili word pamoja. We are all in this together because it doesn't help if there is a cure in Texas, but we don't have it in the Turkana. It doesn't help if there is a vaccine and the rich countries are buying billions and billions of capsules, but the rest of the world doesn't have them. We are all in this together. And from a person of faith, I believe God is showing us during this pandemic in such a dramatic way that the church is not a building. It has never been a building, no matter how beautiful it may be. The church is not an organization incorporated somewhere, but the church is a movement where the good news of the gospel is going to be preached to every tribe, to every tongue, to every kingdom, and then Jesus will come. So we are not limited by space, we are not limited by a building or even an ideology. The only thing that limits us is our mind and whether we are open in our hearts to reveal to and to receive the good news of Jesus Christ. So this morning I'm actually going to do something I have never done before. I have taught and lived leadership from the time I was a tiny girl growing up in communist Romania. I wanted to be a lawyer from the time I was two feet tall. Somehow I had this deep calling inside my heart. But this morning I felt impressed that we actually need to look behind the curtain to understand leadership in the cosmic context understand leadership in the cosmic context because this is the foundation for everything else that we will be speaking about during this camp meeting. So with that in mind, please join me for a word of prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, my Lord, my strength, and my Redeemer. So this morning, dear viewers, I want us to go behind the curtain. We are going to de delve into issues that may sound quite controversial, but if we understand what I'm going to speak about in the next 30 minutes, I think our lives will truly, truly be changed. So let's start with the universe, <laughs> not a big task, right? Let's start with the universe. What is going on behind the scenes? What is the governing principle of God's universe? 
And I would like to submit to you this morning that it is love. God's governing principle of the universe is love. And the disciple who referred to himself very modestly as the disciple whom Jesus loved, he actually wrote this in 1 John 4, 7 to 9. My dear friends, we must love each other. Love comes from God. And when we love each other, it shows that we have been given new life. We are now God's children. And we know him. God is love. Now this is the only time or this, uh, this attribute that God is love. We hear about God being merciful and God being holy and God being just. But the essence the essence of God's character is love. So love is who God is. God is love. And anyone who doesn't love others has never known him. God showed his love for us when he sent his only son into the world to give us life. So the governing principle of God's universe is love. And his modus operandi, the way God works, is through delegation and free choice. He works through delegation and free choice. I would like you to remember this because this is so different from what we will be discussing shortly. So the governing principle of God's universe is love. So let's go to the creation. We all know the creation story, at least those of us who have been raised in, in a Christian context. In Genesis 1, 26 to 27, and I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. What? Male and female created he them. So male and female were created in God's image at the beginning of creation, and they were supposed to rule over the earth, they were supposed, in the King James Version, to have dominion over the earth. Are we together so far? Male and female, Adam and Eve, were created to rule over this earth. And remember, what is the governing principle of the universe? The governing principle of the universe is love. God operates by delegation and free choice. Delegation and free choice. So the expectation is very clear that Adam and Eve were created to rule over the earth, to have dominion over the earth on the basis of the same principles, love through delegation and free choice. And then in, in Genesis 2, 4 to 5, there is a very interesting verse that most of us have never read. And I have to admit, as I prepared for this, for this foundational talk here this morning, this really, really jumped out. And it says, this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord made earth and heaven. Now, no shrub of the field was yet in the earth and no plant of the field had yet sprouted. For the Lord had not sent rain upon the earth and look at this there was no man there was nobody to cultivate the ground so god didn't put all these things into the earth until he had the plan until he had the plan for mankind he was looking god was looking for stewards god was looking for managers he was looking for leaders. You know, we often say God created us so we could worship him. And that is true. God desires our worship. But that's, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible actually says that God, he was looking for people to do things. He was looking for people to do things. So God created mankind as stewards. He created them as, as managers, as leaders. 
and he created them to have dominion, dominion over the earth. So when Adam and Eve were created, they were given dominion. And this is beautifully said in Psalms 115, verse 16. The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth, the earth he has given to the children of men. So it's very, very clear that God created Adam and Eve. He created them to have dominion, and he created them to be stewards, to be managers of the earth. And it is understood that he expected them to live according to the principles that govern the universe, the guiding principle of love, delegation, and free choice. Are we together on this? Thank you so much. So that's the first act. The second act, while God is creating this pristine earth, while God is creating Adam and Eve, Long before then, there was a rebellion, a rebellion in heaven. And I could cite many, many verses about this, but I want to focus specifically on Revelation 12, verse 7 to 9, and then verse 12. Revelation 12, 7 to 9, and then verse 12. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now you see the word Michael here. Whenever Jesus, and I don't have time to go into the details of this, but whenever Jesus is fighting Satan directly in the cosmic context, he's referred to as Michael. Michael is our prince. He is our Messiah. He's the one who is fighting for us. So Michael is defeating the dragon. And Revelation continues to say, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows his time is short. Because he knows his time is short. So we would read this, these verses and say, well, it's all good and well for the heavens, but we are in trouble here on this earth, aren't we? And this is because of the rebellion in heaven. Now, how did this come about? This is a mystery that we will not understand. And maybe even when we get to heaven in the new earth, new heaven, new earth, we may not fully understand this. But there was rebellion in heaven. So Hollywood did not invent Star Wars. <laughs> this happened a long, long time ago. And Isaiah 14, 12 to 14 tells us, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Please note, how many eyes are in this verse? Five. I, I, I. It's all about I. And Satan says, Lucifer at this point says, I will be like the Most High. So rebellion in heaven. So if we look at Lucifer's pathology, he was this amazing angel that God had created. His pathology is narcissism. He has a God complex. It's all about him. I, 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 I. It's all about him. I, I, I. And remember in the Garden of Eden, we know this story very well during creation, he says to Adam and Eve, if you eat from the fruit, you will be like God. This was the desire of Lucifer from the very beginning. And if God is withholding something good from you. So he is projecting that God is self-centered. 
So the governing principle of Satan, as opposed to the governing principle of God's universe, his governing principle is utter selfishness, it's ugliness, it's complete self-absorption, selfishness. And Satan's modus operandi, his way of working, and I think we have all felt this at one time or another, or you may even feel it right now. His way of working is force, deception, and fear. His way of working is force, deception, and fear. Remember, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So if you are really afraid about something, you need to stop and think, where is this coming from? So that was act two. So in the first act, we had a pristine creation. In the second act, we had a rebellion in heaven caused by a fallen angel, Lucifer. Act three, the fall of Adam and Eve. This is now in the future. Adam and Eve fall and... God basically promises, I will put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He, God, Jesus, will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. So look at this. This is all in the future. And this is so important for us to understand, because at the beginning, dominion was given to humankind. Dominion over this earth was given to Adam and Eve. But now look at what is happening. At the fall of Adam and Eve, dominion is transferred from, this, from, from Adam and Eve to Satan. So dominion over this world is, is transferred. And the, there are many scriptures that, that show this very clearly, but I just want to focus on one in Job, Job, uh, the whole chapter of Job, actually, but just Job chapter 1, 6 to 7. There is a, uh, basically a meeting in heaven, if you will, a council in heaven. The sons of God are coming to God. They are presenting themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? From where do you come? So Satan answered to the Lord, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. So if you buy a piece of land, what do you do? You walk to and fro. You walk to and fro. It's the symbol of possession. And Satan makes it very clear that he's in possession of this earth. So dominion over the earth transferred to Satan after the fall. And... When Jesus, fast forward to Jesus at the end of his life here on earth, in John 12, 31, Jesus looks out and he says, now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. So until the cross, yes, God had his beachheads on earth. He had his prophets, he had his kingdoms, he had his people who were obeying him. And he wanted to use the children of Israel as a beachhead, as the nation on the hill who would actually proclaim the good news, who would proclaim what God is like. So yes, God had his beachhead on this earth. But until the cross, it is very, very clear that Satan was the ruler of this world, that he had dominion. But praise God for the cross, which is act four. Praise God for the cross. And I see the children are using the same, the same verse here, which we will be, I guess, uh, using a bit later. At the cross, let his mind, this is Philippians 2, let his mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. And because of that, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, and of those on earth and those under the earth. So the cross 
is a major, major shift. The cross is a changing point. And, and this is where we need to stop, particularly as Christians, for, for a moment. Because what are we taught? Why did Jesus die for us? Why did Jesus die? And we often say Jesus died to forgive my sins, right? And that I can go to heaven someday, right? But is that everything? Have you ever stopped to think, why did Jesus have to die on the cross? Who demanded the price? Just think for a moment. If your child was kidnapped, who makes the ransom demand? If your child was kidnapped, who makes the ransom demand? It's the kidnapper, isn't it? It's the person that has caused the harm. And I can just imagine that before, long before you and I were born, long before this earth was created, there was a council in heaven. And God basically said, if there is sin, we will step up to the plate and we will pay the price. So who demanded the price? Why did Jesus have to die in this horrible way? Because the kidnapper, Satan, demanded the price. He said, I will not let my kidnapped people go. Even Moses, even Moses, he, he wanted to dispute. I will not let them go until you, God, Universe. The God of the universe said, Satan, we will pay the price. And so at the cross, when Jesus said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's not just reciting Psalm 22. He's doing that, yes. And everybody around him would have known that, certainly the Jews. But he's also saying when Jesus hangs on the cross, he is saying, I am taking the blame for everything that happened under my watch. At that point, Jesus is saying, I am taking the blame for all the sin, all the evil, everything that has ever happened on this earth and in the universe. I take the blame. And that is why Jesus felt forsaken, because he was taking your blame, my blame. And, and when he said, it is finished, when he said, it is finished, it was the loudest triumph in all the universe. Because Colossians 2, 14, 15 tells us, God made you alive in Christ, for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed. What does it mean to disarm? You take the weapons away, doesn't it? He disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. So when Jesus says it is finished, what he's telling Satan and the entire universe is you have lost I have disarmed you, and I am reclaiming dominion over the earth. I am reclaiming dominion over the earth. Fast forward to the resurrection. After the resurrection, Jesus gets together one more time with his disciples. And he says to them, folks, let make, let's, let's, let's see what this is all about. Let's make my death count. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority. How much authority? All authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, 
teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. So at the cross, I want you to get this, at the cross, dominion is transferred from whom? Satan to Jesus. And Jesus is saying, I am reclaiming. All authority is given. And at the cross, he has disarmed, he has disarmed, he has taken away the weapons of all the rulers of this earth. So we are dealing with a foe who is disarmed, but he is not powerless. And that's Act 5. Act 5. The earth, the earth, in spite of what happened at the cross, the earth remains a territory, territory in dispute until Jesus comes. So yes, Jesus has reclaimed all authority, but the earth remains a territory in dispute until Jesus comes. And Paul again, pulling the curtains aside, says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. This is in Ephesians 6.12. So Paul makes it very clear that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities. These are principalities, but they are not killed. They are not dead. They still have power. And they are very, very organized. So if, if you and I would like to think for a moment that we can take Satan on by ourselves, please think again. These are incredibly organized forces. They are incredibly, what did we say in Revelation? That, 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 that they are going around, they are upset because their time is short. And brothers and sisters and viewers out there, I do believe our time is short. So this earth remains a territory in dispute until Jesus' second coming. I want to share a quotation from you from Ellen White, The Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, page 341. Ellen White is uh, a prolific author. She's a prophet. She is a co-founder of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, to her credentials, she's also the most translated female author of all time, and she is the most translated American author of either gender. So this is from the pen of Ellen White. Satan knows better than God's people the power that they can have over him when their strength is in Christ. When they humbly entreat the mighty conqueror, the mighty conqueror for help, the weakest believer in the truth, relying firmly upon Christ, can successfully, how successfully, repulse Satan and all his host. He is too cunning to come openly, boldly with his temptations, for then, the drowsy energies of the Christian would arouse and he would rely upon the strong and mighty deliverer. But he comes in unperceived and works in disguise through the children of obedience who profess, get this, who profess godliness who profess godliness. God is you, uh, using the church, but Satan is also using people who just profess godliness. So, victory is ours in Christ. It Welcome back, viewers, and uh, sincere apologies for the technical uh, glitches here. It just reminds us that uh, we live in an imperfect world, and when we are trying to synchronize 
many cables and many systems, sometimes things don't go as planned. However, I hope you spent this time in prayer. I hope that you didn't leave. And I hope that we are still together because I want to finish with these incredibly powerful messages. Act number five, victory is ours in Christ. And this is coming back to the Gospel Commission. This is where Jesus says, I have been given all, all authority in heaven and on earth. So how then shall we lead? How then shall we live? We need to recognize deep in our hearts that Jesus is stronger. He has disarmed the devil at the cross. He has already won. So how then shall we live? Given that this world is a war zone, we establish that. Given that Jesus disarmed the powers of Satan through his death on the cross. And given that God is love and he has given us delegated authority to conquer nations by the power of of his unconditional love. And this is why, where I would like each one of us to stop. Each one of us to stop and think, how have we lived? How are we living? How can we make a difference for God's kingdom when his character is love, if the weapons we are using are the weapons of the devil? If the weapons we are using our selfishness, our jostling for position, our power plays. How are we going to live? God is love, and he has given us delegated authority. And he is basically saying, I want you to go, my people. I want you to go and conquer nations. This is why we still have this time. Christ didn't just die so we, our sins are forgiven and we can go to a new heaven and a new earth. God died. Jesus died on the cross so his kingdom would come. His kingdom would come. So the choice is ours. We can lead boldly by the power of God's love or we can just exist consumed by the love of power and selfish pursuit. And we see so much of that in the world that is surrounding us. So in closing, I would like to invite you to pray the Lord's Prayer. It is actually not the Lord's Prayer. It is the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. I want you to pray it like you have never prayed it before. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please go and conquer nations in the name of Christ. Be a leader and lead the way God has called you to lead. Amen. <laughs>